Okay, before we start with the power presentation, a few words about the company. LaCroix was founded uh, 1964 by Walter LaCroix, so last year we had our 50th anniversary. Um, we originally came from the high-speed digital digitizer world in the high-energy physics, and uh, the headquarters is based in Chestnut Ridge in the state of New York in the USA, and um, today our focus is mainly on real-time oscilloscopes where we have the widest range of products and most advanced technology ranging from 40 megahertz to 100 gigahertz and uh, we have a long history of innovations and firsts in, in digital oscilloscope technology. Um, we are also a leading company of protocol analyz analyzers and uh, with the purchase we did with two companies uh, CATSI and, and Catalyst, and uh, so this is our main focus today. And um, in the year 2012, we were acquired by Teledyne Technologies and renamed to our new name, Teledyne LaCroix. So today, today's webinar will be presented to you by Ken Johnson. He is a very experienced product manager, over 15 years with the company. He's today director of marketing and a product architect and uh, is a degree in electrical gen gen engineering, I'm sorry, and uh, was awarded also some patents uh, in protocol analysis. So he's a real expert and knows our product very well. And maybe you want to take note of his email address and if you have any questions uh, coming from this webinar, address them either to me or to him directly. Hi, Kito. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, so we're going to start our webinar and uh, talk to you today about the essential principles of power. And as Guido said, uh, we'll have two more after this. So stay tuned and, and please sign up for those as well. So today we're going to cover the principles of measurement of voltage, current, and power from what I call the AC line to distorted PWM type waveforms. All right, so this is our agenda. Uh, we're just going to spend a few minutes describing what we mean by power means a lot of things to different people. And we'll do a quick power overview, and then we'll get right into the basics of, uh, of the line voltage, current, and power, and distorted waveforms, and three-phase power calcs. And we'll show you in a measurement example at the end, and then take your Q&A. All right, so defining power. I use this phrase that I call see the elephant. Whenever somebody tells me that they have something around power. I always ask, what do you mean by power? It means so many different things to so many different people. Um, it's sort of like the blind men touching the elephant and then describing what they see by the very localized area they touch. So it can mean a lot of things. So in this slide, this is a definition of some aspects of power. And uh, these are probably just a few of them. So when engineers talk about power, if they're from the utility side, they really mean that 50, 60 hertz line power that comes out of the wall of your uh, home or, or out of a larger plug at a business or a drop uh, at your business. But engineers who work with power semiconductors talk about device power, which is the conduction and switching loss of the IGBT or MOSFETs. And engineers working on uh, motherboards or printed circuit assemblies, um, they have digital power management issues where they're turning on and off you know, low voltage DC rails and sequencing them during startups. Um, engineers working in the power conversion field design inverter subsections. And so they're really talking about uh, what I call power electronics, uh, variable frequency, PWM type power. And then also power analysis is usually meant in, in uh, conjunction with a power analyzer instrument, you know, a specific product that just does this one thing. And so, um, so these are different ways to speak about power. I always find it's good to review those. Today, we're really talking about line voltage, current, and power measurements, you know, on 50, 60 hertz signals. And we're also talking about power conversion uh, systems measurements, so the pulse width modulated signals that come out the output or the DC bus and link signals as well, and doing the complete power analysis from the output to the input. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick power overview. Um, this is uh, just, just very short, very instructive. Um, electricity primarily today is still generated at um, 
what I call stationary generators or, or centralized utility generating plant, that is changing quite quickly. And, and certainly in our lifetimes, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot more happen. So there's a big trend towards distributed generation where uh, solar PV or wind, uh, depending on where you are, might provide a very significant portion of the utility line power. Uh, then that uh, power, that electricity is transmitted and distributed to homes, commercial locations, and industrial users, and it's consumed. And it can be consumed directly from the wall. You know, it's a line, 50, 60 hertz power with no conversion. Or there could be various types of power conversion applied, which are called drives, variable frequency drives, switch mode power supplies, inverters, or converters. This is kind of what it looks like historically. And as I said, again, it's changing quite a bit very rapidly. But uh, the big problem here is as, as power is generated here at the generating station and moved over transmission lines, it's stepped up in voltage, stepped back down, stepped back up and down. Um, so what we see is uh, a lot of losses in this uh, power flow. Um, the overall power delivery efficiency of this traditional type system is about 32%, which is really just horrible. Um, you know, your input-output efficiency on the generation side is only 35%, uh, which is really just abysmal. Um, it's, it's amazing we tolerate this. We have for many years because energy has been so cheap, but that's changing. And, uh, but because this, uh, this situation existed, there was also a need to measure losses in the transmission and distribution line, which were also a significant percent of the uh, total losses. So utilities historically wanted to measure losses in the step up, the power, the substation, and the distribution transformers, and also in power cables and other associated equipment. So historically, um, you know, someone who made these types of devices and supplied them to utilities would test this transformer with something called a power analyzer, and they'd measure the load losses and the core losses or the no load or excitation losses of a transformer, and it would calculate efficiency it was done kind of as a final validation test to uh, give the utility a report that they were getting what they purchased, you know, in terms of efficiency on the transformer. It might shock some of you to know that motors, for instance, the consumption of power, 45% of worldwide delivered electricity is consumed by electric motors. Um, and uh, a lot of that is, is by very big motors. So, but it almost follows the 90-10 rule, where 90% is done and consumed by very, very big motors, but those big motors only represent 10% of the total motor. So a few motors consume most of the motor electricity, and most electricity delivered is consumed by motors. So um, these were essentially only line-powered prior to the 90s, uh, and then various government mandates and rules and regulations emerged to make them more efficient and driving the efficiency were really the use of drives. But historically, they weren't drive driven. They were just driven off a 50, 60 hertz line. Again, a motor had the ability, uh, the efficiency of a motor had the ability to really impact the amount of electricity used. So they were tested on a test stand by the manufacturer and certified. It's what I would call the static load test. There'd be a dynamometer to put a load on it. You'd use something like this power analyzer you calculate efficiency at one speed and load, and you get a number that was X percent efficiency. Um, historically, this was really a final validation tool. It's not an integrated design tool. Uh, it doesn't really help you with dynamic load measurements. Also, it doesn't let you debug your control, your power conversion section at the same time to see if that's affecting your efficiency. So, um, but big things are changing. So, as, as all of us know, really, we're seeing more and more power conversion devices uh, back in the 80s, it was switch mode power supplies, really small things. As devices became more reliable at higher voltages, those things migrated up into a higher voltage, higher power world, motors, then bigger motors, things like grid-tied inverters, DC to DC converters that are very compact at very high power levels, primarily for automotive propulsion. And now you have uh, very advanced electric vehicles, um, and uh, they, they contain very, very advanced electric drives which use power conversion. Historically, um, there's a, a range of different types of equipment engineers use, ranging from power analyzers that can perform three-phase power analysis and also integrate motor measurements, oscilloscopes that are used 
to measure control capabilities, and then things that kind of sit in between, like our, our motor drive analyzer that perform all these functions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the basics for AC line voltage, current, and power. And um, let's get right into it. So the first thing we'll talk about is AC sinusoidal line voltage. And uh, you've, you've heard of this before. You've seen it before. It's what comes out of your wall plug at your home. And it's referred by a lot of different terms like grid, household, line, power line, utility, or mains power. But it's all the same thing. Uh, when you hear a value for that, like in the U.S., 120 volts, in Europe, 240 volts, when they say volts, it means volts RMS. It might be also stated as volts AC, but what that really means is volts RMS. Those terms are used interchangeably in this context. At your home, the power is single phase, a two wire. In the U.S., it's quite common to have a single phase three wire where we can get 240 volt off a service, but then 120 volt um, for uh, individual uh, single phase two wire connections as well. Um, industrial locations use three phase power, either three or four wire. Um, more than three phases is not common. Uh, it's typically in, in applications that require redundancy for reliability, like in aircraft or military applications. Um, when you're measuring voltage, uh, the reference point for voltage can either be to a neutral uh, for single phase or, or two phase, three wire right here, or it can be to another line for multi-phase, like a three-phase application. Um, ground uh, is a safety connection from a chassis chassis to earth. It's not the same as neutral, so we always refer to it as line to neutral when we're talking about a ref reference point. And the shape of a line voltage should be nominally a sine wave. It's never a pure sine wave, but it's very close. There are some rules and regulations that require it to maintain a minimum level of distortion um, as delivered. So uh, single phase AC voltage, basically, you can think of this as a, a voltage vector that has both magnitude and angle. This rotates. So as it's rotating, um, the angle is changing. And the magnitude at any given moment in time is a product of the voltage vector magnitude, which is typically constant, or, or roughly so, and the angle of rotation. So it's V times sine the angle. And basically, as that rotates like this, um, you're going to create your sine wave. So the rotation creates a sine wave like this. If you plot the formula out using the angle in radians, you're going to see on, on Excel, for instance, you can see that you get a sine wave. The frequency used, 50 hertz in Europe, 60 hertz in the U.S., a combination of both in Asia. Um, other frequencies are sometimes used in specialized applications, but not by utilities. Okay, so when we think about the 120 volts AC, this example is 120 volts AC. This would be very similar for a 240 volt AC European example. You could just double these quantities. But we call this 120 volts AC. That's really RMS, as we rated stated before. And the voltage is measured line to neutral in this single phase case. So we're talking about single phase right now. Okay, but when you look at this, the peak voltage is much higher. So the peak voltage is square root of 2 times 120, or square root of 2 times the VRMS AC voltage. In this case, almost 170 volts, as you can see on this plot. And then the peak, the peak voltage is 2 times that, so 340 volts. If I rectified this signal to get DC, well, you can kind of follow that flow. You'd see properly filtered and whatnot with a capacitor, you would get 170 volts DC nominally. Uh, a lot of times I hear people ask, what does true RMS mean? They, they hear the term RMS, true RMS. Um, this is my personal opinion. I don't think you necessarily find this in Wikipedia necessarily, but tr true RMS is not what I would call an engineering def definition. It's a marketing definition to describe a what I call a mathematically correct RMS calculation as compared to a measurement shortcut uh, taken in inexpensive instruments. The measurement shortcut in a cheap multimeter uh, what they call RMS is really just peak-to-peak -peak measurement divided by the square root of 2. They're assuming it's a good sine wave, which isn't really necessarily the case, so you have to be careful. If someone says they have a true RMS meter or measurement, it really just means RMS, and honest people will just say RMS because that's all I really have to say. Um, companies that take shortcuts should really call it false RMS. They shouldn't call it RMS at all, so just be a little careful. Um, 
basically any sampling technology product, whether it be a handheld meter, an oscilloscope, a power analyzer, etc., will be calculating VRMS and IRMS correctly. Um, but they won't market their calculation as true RMS. Okay, so uh, let's talk about three phase. So three phase voltage is really the same as single phase. I've only had one vector before, and now I have three. They're separated by 120 degrees uh, by definition, and they're all of equal magnitude. And so therefore, if I sum all these components up, I get zero at the neutral. That's by definition. Uh, the three phases are typically referred to on the line side as A, B, and C, uh, but lots of other conventions are used. Uh, some drive manufacturers call the line input RST. Uh, some call it 1, 2, and 3, L1, L2, L3, et cetera. But they all mean the same thing. Um, this rotates, right? So it rotates because the generator creating the voltage is rotating. And so by definition, these are rotating at a certain frequency, just like in the single phase case. As they rotate, they always stay 120 degrees apart. And, um, and now you get three sine waves. So not just one. And the peaks of the three sine waves are separated by 120 degrees and the peaks are all of equal amplitude. So for any given, um, any given phase, you could make the voltage calculation just as we did before, um, and, and we could calculate all this out, and we will. Um, a lot of people ask, why three phase? Um, well, it's really more efficient to generate power with three phase. Uh, it's easier to manufacture high power equipment with multiple phases, and there's better control capability for low power motors. Um, I get a lot of questions, why not four phase, why not five phase, I, I, I don't know, quite frankly. Um, I think the reality is, is three is enough, it's good, it's cheaper than probably doing multiple phases, it's really all that's necessary. It's what the industry standardized on, you know, in the late 1800s, so that's, that's what we have. Um, all right, so now as we look at three phase voltage measurements, here's where things get a little tricky. You can measure line to line or line to neutral. So line to line would be from phase A to B. Normally, it's, it's not referred to as a vector notation. This is really just a convention. So in this case, A to B means A to B, with A being the higher, so the vector pointing in this direction. Um, or you can measure line to neutral. So you can measure VA, prop, commonly written VA to neutral or VA to N. Um, and you, know, you could do the math, and you could do a conversion from a line to line voltage to a line to neutral just by following this math. Line to neutral will be square root of three, uh, the line to line value divided by square root of three, and the phase difference will be 30 degrees. You could mathematically just kind of solve that from even from this simple diagram here. Okay, so um, it's also good to know that to achieve this three phase, there could be a variety of different connections. I've shown this here as a coil, like you'd have in a motor or a transformer. This is what's called a Y, because it resembles the letter Y. The neutral point is in the middle here, and then the phase, uh, the line side here, is on the, on the outer end of the winding. Um, this is most common, I think, overall, especially in motors. But quite often, the neutral is not accessible. It might be buried. So it's connected, but you can't get to it for measurement purposes. Um, so that's why a lot of people just measure line-to-line -line voltage. You can also have a delta connection, which there is not a neutral present in most cases. And uh, you have to measure line-to-line. -line, and this looks the, the way it does here. Uh, note that here, it's pretty easy. If I put a current probe or a current so uh, measurement device here, I'm measuring the current directly through the coil. Here, I'm not measuring the current through one coil if I put a current measurement device here. The current goes here, and it splits between two coils. So um, subtle difference of, of note uh, for people making those kinds of measurements. OK, so as we look at the voltages, where it gets a little tricky, this is still, in the US, this is still called a 480 volt AC system. In Europe, 380 volts or 400 volts, right? But um, that, that voltage level now, quoted volt AC, is a line to line voltage. It's not a line to neutral voltage. Um, so um, therefore, the math is a little bit different. Um, the peak voltage now, if you follow through, it's a little bit different calculation because it's a line-to-line -line voltage. The peak voltage is square root of 2 times the line-to-line -line voltage rating, or in this case, square root of 2 times 480 volts AC. If that was a 400-volt system, you'd be in the high 500 volts uh, for that peak voltage. And then the peak-to-peak -peak voltage is 2 times that, or almost 
1400 volts in this case. So if you have a neutral wire present, you can measure the voltage line to neutral. Um, that would just be, as we described before, the line to line voltage divided by the square root of three. So on a 480 volt AC system, the line to neutral voltage is only 277 volts AC. Then in this case, if you wanted the peak line to neutral voltage, it's square root of two times the line to neutral voltage, which is in this case, a little under 400 volts and the peak to peak would be two times that or a little under 800 volts. So if you rectify all three phases, which would be rectifying a line to neutral signal, then the DC value would be calculated as here. So square root of two times the line to neutral times the square root of three, because you have three different uh, phases here that are adding vectorially. And so that is going to give you something just shy of 700 volts once it's filtered. This, of course, shows the addition of all these things, but not filter. But you can see it would be about 679 volts DC when you're all done. If you just compare these two, um, this is the same information as before. The line of neutral is a lower voltage. And if you look here at the peak, here's the peak of the line of neutral. Here's the peak here for the line to line. There's a 30 degree phase difference between the two, as, as we described earlier. Uh, you might have heard about voltage classes, like, uh, uh, like a, a utility class. So uh, in the US, we have a group called ANSI. Usually all their standards are shared with IEEE. Um, then there's IEC and other similar organizations around the world. These are utility voltage classes per ANSI C84.1-1989. Now, this one is this low voltage class is not an ANSI class, uh, but it's commonly referred to as a safety class. Basically, anything under 50 volts you can touch, you're probably not going to be injured. Um, so it's commonly referred to as kind of a safety class, but it's not a utility voltage class. Then. Uh, the utility voltage classes are low voltage, which uh, for those used to working with printed circuit boards uh, where 20 volts might be high, um, 600 volts in this case is low voltage. And that's what's called the distribution class. This is basically less than 1,000 volts RMS. Um, it's called the 600 voltage class. It encompasses 400 volts in Europe, 600 volts in Canada, um, 480 volts in the US and everything kind of in between. Um, and it encompasses all the residential and small commercial single phase voltages and these higher voltages as well. The max you could get to this would be 600 volts plus 15%, which be like a worst case definition of, of uh, overload of voltage on the line. And if you did all the math to figure out what 690 volts three phase rectified would be, it would come out to just under 1,000 volts which is why this is considered a less than 1,000 volt RMS class. Then you get into medium voltage for generation, distri distribution, and subtransmission. These are 5 kV all the way up to 69 kV classes. Um, and then for high, very high voltage, uh, it goes even higher. Um, we're starting to see uh, you know 1,000 kV or megavolt class equipment being installed. Uh, devices used to measure high voltage it range it ranges everything from a high voltage differential probe used to a scope. They might have ratings from one at two kV or six kV safety rated. Uh, this is our probe here. It's an HVD series probe, which have very good accuracy and very good performance and, and fairly high bandwidth. Um, a lot of people use high voltage passive probes, which go up to similarly high voltages or perhaps even higher. Uh, beyond about six kV. Um, you're probably using something like a, a voltage potential transformer, uh, maybe a uh, uh, not a, a handheld device, but now something like a differential amplifier, which would be something like this made by CIC Research, which can go very, very high in voltage. Or for lower voltages on the device side, uh, maybe something like this or a differential amplifier, uh, which we, we manufacture. All right, so let me pause for the first polling question. Um, if if you're involved in this field and you're measuring voltage, just answer this question. What do you use to measure voltage? You can, you can, I believe you can make multiple answers. Um, so please feel free to take a minute here and uh, answer this question for us. Thank you.
Okay, we'll keep the poll open for just a little bit longer. We see there's still people answering. Okay, and there's still a few more answers rolling in, so we'll just wait just a little bit more time. Okay, I'm guessing we're getting ready to wrap up, so, um, yep, there we go. We just wrapped up, so now we'll continue on. Thank you for answering those questions. Much appreciated. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, AC line current or sinusoidal line current. This will be very fast because most of what we just discussed for line voltage is very much the same. So, again, it's always specified as an RMS value. Uh, it might be called AC. Uh, again, these terms are used interchangeably in this context. You could have single phase or three phase. Uh, the measurement reference point, it's always a line current. You can't have a line to line current. That doesn't make any sense. So, um, and as we described before, in a Y system, all line current flows to neutral. So line currents are what would be called a winding current. In a delta system, the line currents are terminal currents that flow to two different windings. So just something to be aware of there. And the shape, it nominally is sine wave as delivered by the utility, but not a pure sine wave. There's always some distortion. The standards usually specify no more than 5%. Again, uh, you can think of this as a voltage vector. It rotates. There's frequency to it. Everything is pretty much as we described for the voltage case. And if you plot that rotating vector out, it looks like a sine wave, just as before. If you have a three-phase system, then you have three vectors, and they rotate together, and they're separated by 120 degrees, and the frequency of rotation is 50 or 60 hertz for utility supplied voltage, and they look like this when you all uh, have them together measured in one system. And so, and then you can calculate the current value based on the angle of rotation and radians. So this is pretty much all like the voltage case. Um, to measure current, you could use a variety of different devices. Uh, for instance, um, on an oscilloscope, you'd use a current probe, something that looks like this for 150 or 500 amps, or, or like a smaller jaw for 30 amps. Um, these, are, these are very good devices. They're very accurate. They have a very high bandwidth range, and they, and they reach all the way down to DC, but they are expensive. So you have to have the need for this kind of uh, frequency range and accuracy. Um, to really make use of them. Um, for people who don't have that, sometimes they'll use something like a specialty current transducer like this DanaSense device here. These are very good accuracy too. The frequency range is, uh, is a lot less. It's in the, it's in the low kilohertz range, uh, a low 100 kilohertz range. Um, these devices are good uh, for measuring to DC. If you're looking at startup events, um, especially on a drive output, um, you really need to be able to reach down to DC uh, to understand what's going on there. So now if you don't need DC, uh, these various devices um, have an AC frequency response, meaning their frequency response might be from a few hertz, like 3 hertz or 5 or 20 hertz, up to something higher, but they don't reach down to DC. So you can never get a DC level. You can't measure a DC bus current with them, but they still have their place. Uh, if all you want to do is measure utility voltages and currents, a Rogowski coil, um, you know, they have a frequency range that fits nicely in that range, um, and they make some that are, uh, that are, that are, they reach down to very low frequencies and also reasonably high frequencies for some other specialized measurements as well. Um, they're split core, they can be opened up and fit around, and the cost is generally very low. Um, Pearson's a company in the U.S., they make a Pearson current transformer. This has a voltage sense resistor built in so it converts the current in the CT 
to a voltage signal, which is then very easy to put in another system that saves a step. Um, or you could use a conventional turns ratio CT, which is really just a brute force core coil type design. Um, and they have a current input through through the center, and then it's a turns ratio with a current output proportional to the turns ratio. You do need a shunt resistor on those on the output to convert to a voltage output to be able to measure in some measurement devices. Um, you have to be careful. Uh, you can have some bad, dangerous open circuit voltages can occur at the output of a device if it's open circuited uh, and there's a large amount of current flowing through it. So you do have to be careful in using some of these devices. Uh, we do make an adapter. This is something, it's a current sensor adapter, which makes it nice to be able to take an output uh, from, from many different current measurement devices and just plug them in our scope. It just, it, it quickly allows you to do something that might take multiple steps and to do it repeatedly. All right, so let's pause for our second polling question. Um, just give us some idea of what do you use to measure current, um, and uh, you can answer more than one of these um, if you're using more than one of these, and we'll just pause for, uh, for a brief moment and let you answer. Thank you. Okay, I still see we have a few more answers coming in, so we'll uh, wait just a few more moments to let those complete, and then we'll continue on. Okay, so we're getting ready to wrap it up, so we'll get back to our presentation here, and we're going to close the poll down and continue on. So thank you for your answers, and now we will continue. Okay, so now let's talk about power calculations. Now that we know, you know, what voltages look like and, and how we measure them and whatnot, um, a lot of times people want to calculate the power. So let's talk about that. First, we're going to assume a single sinusoidal line voltage and a single sinusoidal line current, and we're going to assume it's supplying a linear load. There's a lot of qualifiers here, but this is a simple case. It's kind of what you learn about in a textbook first before you get into a more complex case. So in this case, you would have a single voltage vector and a single current vector, and it would be purely in phase, right? This is simple. Um, Power is just voltage times current. So you can take a voltage magnitude and a current magnitude from any measurement device, just multiply them together, you're going to get the power. Um, and they're always rotating together, so that's simple. Now, however, if you have not a purely resistive load, as in this nice simple case here, okay, but you have an inductive load or a capacitive load, what happens is you now have to concern yourself with something called a phase angle. And the phase angle is the is the degree difference or the radian difference between the location of the current vector to the voltage vector. And um, that is always present in almost any circuit. Almost any circuit has some inductance or capacitance in it. It's hardly ever purely resistive. If you did have a purely resistive uh, circuit, uh, phase angle would be zero, and then therefore the power factor, which is the cosine of the phase angle, would be one. Um, Power factor is how we usually think about this. It's the cosine of phase angle. Um, it's, it's unitless, and it's always positive. So there's never a negative one power factor. It's always zero to one. And then you have to know whether it's leading or lagging. So it's the current's leading, in our case, where the voltage is rotating counterclockwise. The current here, in this case, is leading, and that's what happens on a capacitive load. Or in this case, it's lagging. Um, when these rotate counterclockwise, therefore, it's an inductive load. All right, so if we have phase angle, um, now we have these two waveforms, right? And if you had your current and your voltage waveform, you could, you could, and they were purely sinusoidal. It'd be really simple. You could just measure the phase angle by the delay at the zero crossing point there, um, and you can convert that into radians. 
uh, or degrees, and then you could measure power factor from that by doing the cosine of the phase angle. Um, that's hard to do. It's easy to do with a pure sine wave, but as we'll learn, you typically don't have pure sine waves. Um, so basically, the situation we just described, you cannot simply multiply V times I, current times voltage, to get the power for an inductive load or a capacitive load. You have to do something more, right? So you, you, it has to be a more intelligent calculation. And as you think about this, you don't just have one power component anymore. You have three power components. And the three power components are what is called the real power, shown here in green, okay? The uh, reactive power, shown here as uh, gold, and uh, shown as Q, uh, or in quadrature with the real power, which is why it's typically called Q. And then the apparent power, which is called S, and that is the quadrature sum of the real power and the reactive power. And the phase angle, between the voltage and current vector is also the phase angle between the apparent power and the real power component. And all these things can be calculated this way. Now, this also, by the way, this assumes you have sinusoids, pure sinusoids, and that you can actually measure this phase angle. All right? So if you can actually measure a phase angle between the two pure sinusoids, then the real power is just, just simply the apparent power times cosine of the phase angle. The apparent power, or this quantity here, is simply the RMS value of the voltage and the RMS value of the current for a given power cycle. So you have to know the true RMS value for a given power cycle. And then the reactive power can be solved as just the quadrature subtraction of uh, P from S. All right. So um, the, the real power, just think of that, is what's consumed by the load. The apparent power is required by the load to make it work, um, even if it's not all consumed and the reactive power is the component that just kind of moves around within the circuit but never does any work. It just gets transferred around continuously uh, between um, various elements of the circuit. Now, if we looked at these pure sinusoids, again, we're, we're going to call this a purely linear load, um, and this is uh, something that, in this case, it's a toaster, right? So I just took a toaster, and I probed voltage and current, and I used one of our uh, HDO oscilloscopes, um, and you can see here as I probe the voltage, this is set at 50 volts per div. You could, this is 120 volts. You could follow this out to about 170 volts peak, minus 170 peak. This is my current right here, and uh, that's 5 amperes for division, so it's drawing about 10 amps uh, peak, um, 7 amps RMS or so. And you can see these things are perfectly in phase, right? It's what you'd expect. They're actually not quite perfectly in phase, um, but Visually, they seem to be that way. And you can see, though, there is some distortion here. And so even what we think of as pure sinusoids are really never pure sinusoids. Um, I, I did, just for yucks, I took our motor drive analyzer, which measures three-phase and single-phase power, and I calculated all the quantities. And you can see the voltage here is 114 volts RMS, a little less than rating, and the current's about 7 amps RMS. And we calculate the power. There is a very small amount of reactive power so small, it's kind of lost in the rounding. You get a very near zero phase angle, and that rounds up to a 1.0 power factor. So this is kind of what we would expect. Um, and then if I, if I took this, this is actually a, a longer measurement now of that same thing. I've, I've taken a several second acquisition, two seconds, and I've turned the toaster on, and the toaster starts generating heat through the coils here, and then it goes off, and the current goes to zero. and um, Basically, here I'm just showing, you know, what's happening with the power trend over time um, and all these different calculations. In this case, um, during this dynamic activity, uh, the circuit behaves a little bit differently, and you don't necessarily have uh, the same results at all times during the operation. Okay, so just some quick conclusions for AC line voltage, current, and power. Um, line voltage ratings are really different from typical voltages many engineers are familiar with, engineers who do printed circuit board designs. They're much higher. Um, they're not a DC voltage. They're a complex voltage that has can be thought of as RMS or peak or peak to peak. Um, Three-phase systems are a very complex mix of magnitude, phase, and rotation, and they do introduce additional measurement challenges. Um, Power has to be thought of as different components based on a phase angle. 
So you have a real, apparent, and a reactive power. And, and therefore, you can really never think of line power as just a simple V times I calculation. It's, it's really much more than that. Okay, now we're going to talk about distorted waveforms. Um, realistically, even the nice sine waves coming out of your wall socket, as you saw on that previous screen image, um, can have distortion on them. So realistically, all waveforms are distorted. Uh, there are no pure sine waves developed and generated and delivered by the utility. But when you get into pulse with modulated waveforms, like on the output of an inverter or a drive, they can get really distorted. By definition, they're highly distorted signals. Um, so let's talk about that. What do we do? Okay, so um, this here graph, uh, most of us learn our first year for electrical engineering student, students, we learn first year that any square wave signal is really just a summation of various amplitudes of odd integer sine waves. And so if I, in Excel, if I take Excel and I just create a lot of different sine waves of odd integers here, and I show the third, fifth, the seven, et cetera, and I also show a fundamental sine wave, well, basically as I add up the fundamental plus the third, fifth, and the seventh, what I get is something that starts looking like a square wave. And so, um, so, so therefore, you can think of any pulse width modulated signal that kind of has varying width square waves. That is really composed of many different sine wave signals. Um, what makes it difficult to make measurements is that every voltage and current frequency will have different magnitude combinations from different harmonic orders, and the phase relationships between the different harmonic orders will be different. So they're not all the same. It's not a constant. Therefore, there is no practical method to measure phase angle between a voltage and current signal when you're dealing with a very distorted waveform. So there's no practical method to simply calculate real power from apparent power. You just can't do it. So there's a different approach that's needed. This is uh, an example here I've captured on, on one of our oscilloscopes. Um, this is an eight-channel scope, so I can capture the three voltages and currents at one time. You can see here I've, I'm measuring some power values as well. And so these sine waves are the, are the impressed current, and these blocky signals, these are the pulse width modulated signals in this kind of square wave envelope. And if I zoom in right here, you can see what this looks like. So here I can see this transition. These are some very narrow pulse widths, right? You see positive going pulse widths, then they go negative. And that's basically if I filtered that, and looked at just the fundamental, I'd see a very low amplitude sine wave within this, within this square wave envelope here. Notice this current waveform. This is pretty interesting. A lot of people don't see this. This looks like noise, but it's not noise. When you look at that, that current is always increasing a little bit whenever the pulse width is high. And when the pulse width goes low, then the current starts to drop, and then it starts increasing again. So it's kind of like a charge discharge, treating the winding as kind of a source and there's a charge discharge that's happening as pulse width voltage is applied and then taken away and then reapplied and taken away. So it's it kind of interesting. Um, so even this sine wave right here that looks mostly not distorted really does have a very high level of distortion on it. Um, plus during overload conditions like right here you can see this current sine wave, well, there's a lot of distortion on that, on top of all that sawtooth shape that we described earlier. So um, overload conditions can really greatly increase distortion. You can see we're measuring in this area right here, we're measuring north of uh, 6 or 7% on the voltage, and we're measuring more than that on the current. Then it gets even worse because um, some of the more economical ways to generate um, voltages for motors, pulse with modulated voltages for, for cheap motor drives or inexpensive motor drives. Um, they use a six-step commutation method and they generate very high levels of distortion. So your, your sine wave, your current is not even a sine wave anymore. It looks really like this and the voltage is, is a trapezoidal shape. So um, the distortion levels can get really, really high. So what do we do? How do we measure power? Well, Basically, you have to use a digital sampling technique, and that is an absolute requirement for distorted waveforms, and it also works on pure sinusoids. So this is a technique that can be used uh, for anything. 
and any any modern power analyzer or oscilloscope or other good quality measurement system that accurately measures power um, is going to use a digital sampling approach. Um, so this is widely applicable across a range of instruments. It's not only something we do, it's something lots of companies do. So basically uh, what we do is we take that nice waveform, in this case I've shown a nice sine wave, it doesn't have to be that though, and we digitally sample it with an, with an analog to digital converter like what's contained in an oscilloscope. And so we, we acquire sample points. And then the second thing we have to do is we have to determine a calculation period. So again, uh, this approach is reasonably widely used. Um, we basically apply a zero crossing detection algorithm uh, to the signal we're measuring, and we calculate a period. So for instance, if this is my signal here, and it can be a very ugly signal, uh, with proper filtering and some hysteresis settings, you can quite easily get a very clean zero crossing determination. So basically we look at that and we say, yeah, here's the zero crossing, positive going, here's a zero crossing, positive going, here's another one. So this is one measurement interval, this is another, this is another, and so on. And then um, on our device, actually, we can actually, after we filter and apply hysteresis, we can see that signal and we can verify visually that we're getting a period determination. You can see that here with these transparent overlays. They're alternating in color. So you, you can see that quite clearly there. Um, so once we know the measurement period, we take that digitally sampled signal and we, we separate the samples into the measurement intervals. Um, and then we apply various formulas. So basically we know that, for instance, in this particular case, if this was the very start of my acquisition, then 0.7 is the first point in my first period. And then 0.18, I'm sorry, 0.24 is the last point. So there's a total of 18 points, or the measurement number of points is 18. In the second interval, the first point is 0.25. The last one is that plus 18. And so basically, we basically what we do is we say, now we assign every sample point to its own individual period, and then we can use that to make all of our calculations. And, and we could talk through the math uh, quite a bit, and we'll do a little bit of that. But basically, very simply, we just create different index points, and we assign the points to them, and then we make all the calculations for voltage, for current, for power, et cetera on each of these individual areas using individual sample points. So what this says here, this is all the formulas for calculating a mean value. Let's assume a steady state condition. So you might have lots of periods and then the mean value of all those calculations of all those periods are shown here. So in any given period, right, you would have a voltage value. J is the individual samples. And so the RMS value is the square root of of the uh, voltage value squared, right? And so, so basically, um, this right here just says take only those points that are within that period and then divide this summation over the total number of points, right? And that's how we calculate the RMS for a given cycle. Um, and then if we have, you know, 10 cycles, we have 10 RMS calculations and we calculate a mean value. We do the same for, for the current and then we calculate the power just by multiplying the real power, just by multiplying point by point the values. We calculate the apparent power by getting the RMS values of voltage and current for each period and multiplying those like this, just the value for the period. So period one for apparent power, we take the period one value for the RMS voltage, the period one value for the RMS current, and we get those values, right? And then the reactive power, we simply take the uh, quadrature subtraction of the real power from the apparent power, and we sign it appropriately. Power factor and phase angle then are just derived from information we've already calculated. So the power factor is um, the uh, real power over the apparent power, as described earlier, and the uh, phase angle is simply the inverse cosine of the power factor. Okay, so um, just a quick conclusion here. Um, we've probably all learned that kind of the textbook description of power calculations, and they really do assume a sinusoidal waveform, um, but that's rarely true. 
And so you do have to understand that it's really way more complex than that in the real world. Um, and you have to apply a different methodology, uh, primarily because, again, there's no practical way to measure phase angle between distorted voltage and current waveforms. I can't do it like I do with a sinusoid where I can simply, you know, put a couple cursors on the screen and measure it if I wanted to. So you have to use a digital sampling technique. Uh, the good news is these digital sampling techniques, they're very robust, and they also work for pure sinusoids. So they're a universal solution. Okay, so this is our last polling question, and then we'll just have a couple more slides. But let me just quickly ask you, uh, with what kind of signals, if any, do you measure power? Um, and just choose one of these uh, three answers for us, please, and we'll just pause for a moment for you to make that choice. Okay, we'll just give a few more moments for the last answers to come in, and then we'll continue. Okay, I think we're just about wrapping up, and we are. Okay, so now let's, uh, now let's go to a three-phase case. So what do we do for three-phase? Well, remember, we've got three voltage and three current vectors, so we're going to have three power quantities as well. We'll have one power quantity for each phase. And if I look at these, as I described before, is a real component in green, a quadrature component uh, in orange, or reactive power component in orange, and the apparent power in blue. And so, very simply, if I, if I can calculate the voltage and current and I can calculate the power for each phase independently, then I can just sum the three phases up and calculate the, uh, the total value of the three-phase system. There are some exceptions, right? If I'm making a line-to-line -line voltage measurement, I have a voltage and a current that are out of phase. They don't relate to each other directly. So we have to do something about that. Another thing you have to think about is, well, a delta winding. You've got a terminal current versus a coil current. Also, for a lot of really good reasons, sometimes a customer might use a two watt meter method. And um, the two watt meter method allows you to use only four signals to make the measurement instead of six, which is useful when you uh, might have a portable instrument or you want to have a limited number of inputs and you need to economize on the number that you use for your power measurements. It's a very valid method. We're going to cover what you do with the exceptions. The in general case is very straightforward. The exceptions take some explanation. So again, as we talked about before with voltage, we could have a line-to-line -line voltage, right? But if we're going to calculate a power quantity for phase A, for instance, I need a line-to-neutral reference voltage and a line reference current, all right? So I can convert that, right? Simply convert that. Uh, we can do a software conversion. We can convert the magnitude uh, back to line to neutral by dividing this by the square root of three, and then we can apply a phase shift to the waveform. So we, we can convert it both in magnitude and in phase, very, very simply. And then we can use that converted waveform to make a correct calculation. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, this is basically how it's done right here. So basically, we've got all three of our systems right here. The current, again, is measured line to neutral. We just do this transformation where we take these line-to-line -line values and we convert them to a line to neutral. And then we just make the calculations, the straightforward calculations on each phase as we described earlier. And to calculate the total three-phase quantity, we just add everything up. Okay, so if you have a delta winding, again, by definition, you are sensing line-to-line -line voltage and you have a terminal current. All right, so these currents are not the coil currents. All right, so we know a current coming into the terminal. Um, the power balance across all three phases may not be achieved. Um, you might have an imbalanced phase. Um, you might want to use a two watt meter method in this case. Um, but in any case, the total three phase power calculation 
is, is what we described as earlier, summation of the phases. Now, two watt meter method, that's a very valid method. You can, you can search the internet for this and you can find all sorts of descriptions of Blondell's theorem about why this works the way it does. Um, but it's completely valid. Um, and this is a way to make three phase power measurements using only four signals instead of six. And you can do it with a, a Y winding or a delta winding. So in, uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we measure two line to line voltages with reference to a common terminal. In this case, we'll call that C. So we're going to measure B to C line to line and, and A to C line to line. And then we measure the two terminal currents flowing into neutral, not from C. All right, and then the mathematical assumption we're making here is that we have balance in our system. So the sum of all the currents is zero, and the sum of all the voltages is zero, which is what it should be if you don't have any, let's say, leakage of current to ground or something like that. Um, so therefore, if you know two of the currents, by definition, you know the third, you can solve for it. And if you no two of the voltages, by definition, you know the third because you can solve for it using these equations. So you can use the two watt meter method to measure three phase power of a system and it's quite commonly used and uh, it's a very valid approach. One thing that gets confusing is, I'd say, uh, and this isn't bad, it's just the way it is, um, typically uh, a power analyzer, I think, um, are always in a two watt meter mode. And so it can be a little confusing that even if you're hooking up three, uh, three voltages and three currents, they're probably still going to make calculations in a two watt meter method. So the, the connection methodology they ask you to employ when you're connecting your voltages might be a little counterintuitive. Um, the numbers come out correct, but the waveforms you might see on any screen display they provide might be a little weird. So for instance, um, like this is a connection diagram, which I've represented as what a, uh, a power analyzer would require from Yokogawa, a good instrument for sure. Um, and this is a connection diagram that, as we've described just before, it's oriented around using two watt meter methods. So you have uh, R to T and S to T and then R to S. So you don't have, you don't have, let's say, a normal phase relationship between all your signals. So if I looked at all the, the signals, I really only have two of them, the S to T voltage and the IS current that really align and, and are a matched pair that I can see. And then these other two associations, they don't align. So when I look at all these signals, the voltage and the current, you might say, how come the phase angle seems really way different on all these different voltages compared to all the currents? It, it's not the same. And the reason is just because of the connection method. Um, the calculations are still correct. The nice thing is when you convert from a two watt meter or a three watt meter calculation to a two, you don't have to reconnect anything. Um, so that's one advantage to it. On our system, we're always using a three watt meter method here. We're, we're always associating the three watt meter uh, phase relationships. When you do a two watt meter connection, we ask you to make a different one. The, the benefit of that is the phase relationships that you can see, even though you can't directly measure and say, hey, that's the phase angle between this voltage and that current, what's nice about this is I can still look at this and say the phase relationships between these three current and voltage pairs are always the same. And so these associate together, these two associate together, and these two associate together. So it's, it's, it's a common point of confusion, someone using our instrument when they're used to using a power analyzer. So I, I bring it up. Okay, uh, just got two more slides and then we'll go to Q&A. This is just an example of kind of bringing everything together. So this is a, this is a three phase uh, 480 volt drive. Uh, it has an AC input from the line and it has a drive output, which is PWM. And then I'm using a two watt meter method. I've got eight inputs on this device on my oscilloscope that makes the power measurements. So I've got four for the line input, four for the drive output. And then I'm calculating these various mean power quantities here. I can see my waveforms right here. I can see they're fairly sinusoidal, as we described. Note that the current on the line side is not sinusoidal at all. And that's because the load is a very nonlinear load. So it draws current in a very nonlinear way. So basically what you see is 
uh, in this case, a couple pulses by the nature of the inverter design. You see a couple pulses for every voltage peak. That's how it's drawing the current relating to how the power electronics are working inside the drive. So even you think you have a nice AC line uh, current, nice and sinusoidal, but you don't, right? So this is the reality of the world today. There's power electronics everywhere, and they draw in a very nonlinear way. Um, and then this is my drive output. You can see it looks a lot like the examples I showed you earlier. Uh, this is the current. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of noise that's very common on a drive output. Um, uh, there's a lot of switching noise. It's all high frequency. It has almost no impact on your measurement. But you can see that sinusoid kind of in this envelope right here. And then power quantities are calculated. So you can see here uh, the RMS voltage, 480 volts nominally uh, for the three-phase system on the input, about a fifth of an amp or 200 milliamps current, uh, total three-phase. And then my drive output is a lot less. So this voltage on the output is only 250 volts, and it's drawing more current. These are my power quantities. These measurements are made on the full spectrum of the acquired signal if I had filtered it. Um, to a harmonic, you'd see some very different values for power factor. And, and note throughout this conversion process, the input-output conversion is about 50%. In this particular case with this load, the conversion gets better as you go higher in amperage. Now, these values are mean values throughout this whole acquisition. Here I've basically plotted uh, the efficiency over time. You can see here that's efficiency. It gets better as time goes on, so it's reaching a higher value here. This is a power factor quantity. You can see the power factor is increasing over time as well as the load ramps up and the current goes higher. This is that same screenshot, just a little bit bigger, so you can see the waveforms in a, in a slightly bigger screen. And that's it. So that's the end of our presentation. We're pretty much just about right on time. And now we uh, will we'll pause. I'm going to ask Guido, who has the question list, to uh, please come back on the line and uh, let us know what questions we have from our audience. And I, I do thank you for attending, and I'm here to answer your questions. In case you have any questions, just use the right-hand uh, fields to enter them, and we will answer them real time. You know, perhaps while we're waiting for any questions, you might want to let the audience know when our part two of our webinar series is. Yeah, part two webinar is uh, on the 18th of February. It's also on a Thursday, same time. So uh, in about uh, three weeks from today, uh, we uh, also have a link to those webinars, the coming, the part two and three the links to the registration is included in the email that is going out automatically tomorrow to all the registrations with the link to the recording of this webinar. All right, super. Thank you, Guido. So we have no questions so far. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. Uh, my email was provided at the very beginning of the webinar. And uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to go and fast forward reverse mode here. We'll get all the way back to the beginning of the presentation. You're very, feel free to send me an email. Uh, if I take a day or so to respond, uh, it might be because I'm on vacation or traveling. Um, I'm happy to respond and um, answer any questions about what we talked about and point you to any additional material we might have on our website to explain anything further. So Ken, a uh, question came in. Um, yeah. About the MDA, um, the question is: We need filter for low frequency at channel input in an MDA. Right. So I probably need a little bit more background on the request, but typically um, I understand the question, right? So typically, a power analyzer has a variety of very low frequency filters like maybe down to a megahertz or 500 kilohertz or something like that, which is quite common. And uh, we have on our MDA, we have a filter at 20 megahertz. We don't have anything below that. But typically when people ask for the filters, what they're really trying to do 
is look at the power only at a variety of uh, frequencies. They don't want to look at all the full spectrum. So I didn't show it in any slide, but in our in our product, we have the capability to harmonically filter in software. So I can choose to set a harmonic filter where I can only filter on just the fundamental, and then we can calculate the power from acquired waveforms on just the fundamental waveform, even if that fundamental waveform is varying in frequency from cycle to cycle. Um, or you could set it to calculate like fundamental through the 50th harmonic or something like that, and then it will just restrict all the calculations to uh, those 50 orders uh, plus the fundamental. Um, and you can specify a range as well. So, so I understand the request. We don't have the exact same type of capability as a power analyzer, but we do provide that capability through software. It's actually a, a more powerful capability to really isolate to very specific frequencies. Um, Ken, um, the person who has asked the question has added another line saying it is different for um, 18 kilohertz and uh, one megahertz volt or something. I don't understand that. Right. So, yeah, if this if this person would and like to not, correspond a little not, bit more. Why not um, implementing at the channel input similar right. to the Japanese manufacturer? Okay. Yes. So, I, I do understand. I actually have a couple power analyzers in my lab, my motor lab. Um, and I've done a lot of cross-correlation. So I, I do completely understand the request. I would like to have what he's describing. Our current product does not have that. Um, you know, if we were to develop new architectures, we would most likely include those kinds of filters. But the current product is not. Um, but we do provide capability to isolate calculations to specific harmonic orders in a, in a different way. And I'd be happy if this person would like to correspond with me. I'd, I'd be happy to learn more about what they were trying to do and uh, understand their requirement a little bit better. Yes. He added, like, voltage channel 1 megahertz current 8K and yep. ERZ -E at customer site. Sure. Okay. So we could probably have a good email exchange a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more. Um, for modern drive development, what is the minimum bandwidth rec recommended for an oscilloscope? So it depends on what role you have in the development. So if you're if you're only focusing on let's say the inverter drive, and all you care about is the input output, I'd say your bandwidth requirements are really pretty low. If you also want to understand, you know, gate drive signals switching and look at device uh, look at device activity as well then your bandwidth needs go up quite a bit now probably you, you want depending on what your device was um, you'd want in the range of 100 to 500 megahertz um, and the um, if you're involved in a control area uh, or a systems engineer where you're trying to understand the interaction of your control system to your drive, to your to your inverter drive circuit, then you probably might want even higher than 500 meg. And the reason I say that is because some control systems are very complex, like someone employing a vector field-oriented control or FOC control. Um, some of those have microprocessors that are probably beyond 500 megahertz. It depends. Like when you get into vehicle development, very very fast high-speed microprocessors. In that case, you'd probably want your, your oscilloscope or your motor drive analyzer to uh, be able to do double duty as a control debug tool or to link and correlate control activity back to your drive system. So the person who asked the question, uh, Thomas, he added like a servo drive specific, specific slide through the Entire development chain, like design and development. That right. was probably so, what he's working Yeah, about. if you really wanted to cover everything, then probably the bandwidth is going to be driven by the microprocessor speed in your in your drive control system. That will be probably the highest speed signals. 
And so if you're involved in that and you want to and you want to be double sure, then you you get enough bandwidth to cover that, and all, it depends on on what the microprocessor is. But it's not uncommon for it to be up to a gigahertz. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I guess I guess that concludes our presentation today, and we look forward to hopefully many of you will be on part two, and uh, we look forward to that time. And I, I thank you very much for your time. My contact information is here. If you wish to correspond further, I'd be very happy to do that. So thank you again, and have a good evening, and we will hopefully talk to you in a few weeks.